happens to be a mathematical part, and my thinking the organizer has allowed me to do so. Um, now, instead of talking about mathematics right away, I would like to mention that this solved an open problem. The open problem is what could I do today? Uh, sorry, I need. Do you understand how this works or to do the keyboard again? Okay, so there are at least three things I could do today. So, first, it's Mother's Day, at least in France. Um, it's also European Parliamentary Elections Day in France. Um, I would say the situation is a bit. Um, well, it's worrying to me, at least. And I won't contribute in any way. Oh, I can celebrate Prakash. So, I'm not actually sure. <laughs> but I certainly hope so. <laughs> um, the next thing I would like to mention is another open question I had before I came here is this one. Why am I here? <laughs> well, certainly because I've been invited and I accepted. But we never actually collaborated. This is not Prakash's fault. He actually tried hard. <laughs> um, we had a very clever scheme for us to collaborate. He sent me, Philip, and told me you should be his PhD advisor and we'll discuss together what he's going to do. Uh, Philip resigned something like four months after the beginning of the PhD thesis. Well, at least in, in reality, in fact, it was one year. Um, so he had another clever scheme. He invited me to heaven on earth. <laughs> um, my answer to that was I submitted a paper to him as an editor. <laughs> He's not tried any further. <laughs> Here, it's called randomness for free. This has been called that way since 2010. And uh, the general framework of that is automata which include both non deterministic and probabilistic choice. And here's a finite case of such an automaton. Um, so it has a transition function. So for those who prefer to read Greek, there's a definition you've got a transition function from a set of states, Q, to subsets of sets of probabilities in Q. But if you prefer graphics, just re look at the above drawing. So that kind of thing behaves as follows. Starts from state, and um, theta will give you a set of possible transitions. And here's one transition. Okay, So you probably have noticed this small arc. One transition is actually a probability distribution on next states. So here, one half, one half. And then you have a second uh, round of choosing, which is now probabilistically choosing between these two, with probability one half. I'm sorry, my slides are actually deterministic. So if you replay the slides, you won't get anything different. <laughs> um, so in that case, it gives you that state. And then you redo the same thing. So here we've got a set of possible transitions. One is this one, which actually does this one uh, deterministically, so with probability one. And there are this group of two arrows, which is the other one. So in my case, I choose the interesting one. So the probabilistic transition on top. And then we'll do some probabilistic ch ch choice uh, and go to, the, to yet another step. So this is a basic description of the kind of thing we are interested in. Um, and I uh, forgot to say this was common work with Roberto Segala. We did that in 2008. Thought Hall produced a horrible proof which proved almost what we wanted to prove uh, with uh, an incredible number of assumptions and only 55 pages proof. And for this talk, I actually realized you could do something completely more general, um, much easier. It's much improved. But anyway, the uh, basic setting is Segala automata, or probabilistic automata, uh, where you have additional 
uh, ingredients. You've got a transition function uh, that incorporates action. So instead of choosing a set of transitions which are just probability measures, it's pairs of the probability measure and an action. Um, and also, these are not finite state or action spaces. Um, you will just assume that there are measurable spaces here. So, I mean, uh, Prakash insisted on having generality and he tended to use analytic spaces, which is pretty general indeed. Um, we'll actually won't need that, just measurable spaces. So, it's even more general if you think of it in, in a sense. Um, our main problem has to do with scalability. So, let me remind you that theta is of this type. It's a map from states to sets of transi transitions, whatever they are. And uh, uh, schedule specify how you resolve non determinism that is, how you choose one transition from this set. And you have two kinds of schedulers. There's the obvious kind, which is not the right one, usually, called pure schedulers. And a pure scheduler takes the whole history of computation. You have all sorts of variants where you only take the last state, and these will, will be called memoryless schedulers. But in general, you take the history of the computation, so the complete trace of actions and states you've seen so far, and you insist that it picks one of the transitions. So formally, in Greek, it must pick an element of the set of the large transitions at state Q. Uh, in general, you need to do anything uh, mathematically sensible to use randomized schedulers or just schedulers Instead of picking one transition, you'll draw one at random. So formally, a randomized scheduler is not one transition, it doesn't give you one transition, it gives you a probability measure on the set of possible transitions. And formally, it means that eta, a randomized scheduler, should return you a probability measure that's concentrated on the set theta of Q. So that is, the probability of being inside theta of Q should be one. Whether you do, whether you use pure schedulers or randomized schedulers, it gives you a way of resolving non-determinism, and then you get a purely random uh, probabilistic system where, um, but I insist once the schedule is fixed. It turns out that it's probably hard, if you've never seen that, it's probably hard to distinguish pure from random schedulers. So you might think, as I used to think when I was younger, um, that they have exactly the same expressive power, whatever that may mean. Um, and certainly, whatever you can do with pure schedulers, you can do with randomized schedulers, because a pure scheduler is something that picks one transition, and you can think of pick, you know, a randomized scheduler that picks the direct measure at this transition, that's exactly the same thing. But conversely, you probably won't see what you can do with randomized schedulers that you can't do with pure schedulers. And here's one example. It's an incredibly simple transition system, three states, one initial state, one final state. And I'm asking you, okay, I'm giving you a scheduler. Given this scheduler, what's the probability of going from start to go? If you use pure schedulers, oh, I forgot to say, this means you've got a non-deterministic choice between a transition above, which chooses this with probability one, or going down, choosing that with probability one. Now, if you use pure schedulers, there are only two pure schedulers here, essentially. The one that chooses the upper transition is the one that chooses the lower transition. If you choose the upper transition, then probabilistically you'll have to go to goal and the probability of reaching goal will be 1. If you choose the other one, then you'll go to the other one and the probability of reaching goal will be 0. On the other hand, if you use randomized schedulers, well, well, you can reach goal with any fixed probability between 0 and 1. So assume I want to reach goal with probability 1 third. Well, I will use randomized scheduler that chooses the upper transition with probability 1 third. And that's it. So in particular, they differ because if, if you look at the set of probabilities of reaching goal that you can have when varying schedulers, you're using pure schedulers, you can only have 0 or 1 as values. And with randomized schedulers, you get all the possible real numbers between 0 and 1. However, however you can uh, um, notice something, which is that the value you can reach with a randomized scheduler is always between 
the val uh, uh, values that you can reach with pure schedulers. Pure schedulers bound randomized schedulers in this sense. And this is actually what we were trying to prove. And uh, this is essentially what Chatterjee, um, Douayen, Jambert, and Insiger called randomness for free. It says, imagine you have a randomized scheduler eta, and uh, given that eta, the probability that running a trajectory along uh, uh, this scheduler, well, using this scheduler, so you make random choices every time, so it, it doesn't give you a unique trajectory, it gives you a distribution over uh, the trajectories, and the probability that your trajectory will fall into, into some prescribed measurable set of paths um, can be bounded by similar probabilities given by two pure schedulers. So for now, it's just a conjecture. Oh, that's also that kind of result in probability theory uh, that seems completely obvious, and once you try to prove it, you're at a loss. Mm, okay, so the point is that this kind of argument is usually one of the basic arguments um, to find algorithms in specific cases. So in cases where you'd like to say, I'd like to know whether whatever the randomized scheduler, the probability of reaching uh, something infinitely often, let's say, is larger than one third, how do you add it? Um, is it true? Well, instead of Looking at all the randomized schedulers, this result will allow you to say it's equivalent to test for all pure schedulers, and there are a lot less, a lot fewer um, pure schedulers to look for. Uh, also, we would like this to work for any measurable set E, so that includes reachability objectives, the set of paths which go through one point, omega reachability, the set of paths which go infinitely often through a certain set of points, and so on. And this much has been proved by Chatterjee, Doyen, Jambert, and Ensinger in 2010 for finite state and action spaces. And our goal is to show that this can be considerably relaxed. Oh, this is not the only thing they prove. Right? So essentially what they do, uh, you have to translate what they do to explain it in this way, by the way, is to apply a principle that Erdos used to use uh, many times. Um, the idea is, I'm giving you a randomized scheduler. And instead of trying to find a scheduler, I draw a, a pure scheduler. I draw the pure scheduler itself at random. And I will draw it at random uh, uh, according to some probability uh, which I have to build. But basically the idea is that for every history H, I will try to choose sigma of H, so the transition that sigma has to choose when in having seen the history H with the probability eta of h that the randomized scheduler gives me. And then, this defines a measure on, on schedulers, on pure schedulers, and then you can show that the probability that the trajectory falls into the required set according to the randomized scheduler, scheduler is the average of the probabilities over pure schedulers when you draw these pure schedulers according to that measure. Um, so the nice thing is that you know that now, um, if you've got an average over sigma of something that is equal to alpha, then for one of the values of sigma, you get a value which is under alpha, and for another one, you get a value above alpha. And so this will give you the desired result. The only problem with this approach, which is not a, at all a problem in the finite case, is to define the sigma algebra on the set of schedulers. Uh, in the finite state in action case, it's very easy. You've got something called the product sigma algebra. The scheduler is essentially just a tuple. Uh, and uh, there's a unique measure pi, uh, as required above, by standard extension theorems, and by that I mean the famous theorem by Karate which I won't recall, by the way. <laughs> For general measurable state in action spaces, you need to find su a suitable uh, sigma algebra on the set of pure schedulers, so it's a set of functions, you might say, okay, it's just product sigma algebra, I beg to defer, I tell you more. And this is the only difficulty. So, here I go. Turns out that I, I only deal with a simple case, which is the first case I dealt with in the paper, 
um, it turns out that if you've got a so-called multifunction, so that is a map from a set to a set of non-empty subsets of another set T, so think of that as states and transitions, um, what I call pure schedulers until now is called a selection of the multifunction. And it turns out that selections always exist. This is exactly the axiom of choice. My problem is not to find selections, it's to find measurable selections. Mm -hmm. okay? I need this map sigma to be, they can't be arbitrary, they have to be measurable. And they have to be measurable because whenever I talk to you about these probabilities that trajectories would fall into some set, I hid a lot beside, behind that. These are defined again by Cartier of Lewis extension theorem. Um, and the basic cases are given by iterated integrals. And just for these integrals to be defined, you need the functions to integrate to be memorable. And this essentially involves uh, sigma, uh, the measurability of sigma. Anyway, if you don't require those selections to be measurable, nothing makes sense. In the finite state case, everything is by definition measurable. So that's no problem there. Okay, and so uh, what I need now is measurable selections of my transition function theta. And there are many theorems that say that these exist in a um, certain number of cases, and it's completely orthogonal to what I want to say. But at least in all reasonable cases, those exist. Um, the literature is a complete jungle. It's uh, uh, horrifying. Well, I use the simplest possible sigma algebra on the set of measurable selections, cell of theta. Um, I could say it in a fancy way and say this is a trace of the product sigma algebra on the subset consisting of the measurable selections. It's usually called the weak sigma algebra. And uh, the basic measurable subsets to me uh, are the sets I'm going to write this way, which are the set of schedulers such that um, the image of Q under this scheduler is in E. So this defines the sigma algebra, um, the least sigma algebra containing these things. And here's the theorem. It says, assume you've got a measurable multifunction. Okay, you didn't expect it to be arbitrary, did you? Um, so it has to be measurable. It has to have at least one selection. Uh, the conclusion is that there's a probability measure on the set of selections. There's no probability measure on an empty set. So it's a pretty minimal uh, assumption. Assume you have a randomized scheduler. Okay? And then there's a unique probability measure that satisfies this. And for n equals 1, this implies that this fancy uh, thing happens, which in a clearer way means that the probability that sigma of q, that is that the transition you would choose starting from state q, is in E, is exactly the probability predicted by the randomized schedule theta. And here's the proof. So the goal is to find pi such that this holds. Um, so define it this way. Um, the sets of this form form what is called a semi-ring in measure theory. That is exactly what you need to use Caratero Dori's uh, extension theorem. And now Caratero Dori tells you, well, to show that this actually defines a measure, you need to check sigma additivity, but sigma additivity not on the whole sigma algebra, just on those particular sets. Which means that if you take any sets, any countable sets, a n, which are in this semi ring a round, and whose union is again in semi-ring, then you need to show that the measure of the union is the sum of the measures. So you see your puzzle, Prakash. Prakash himself said in a paper that's, that I recommend you to read, Probabilistic Relations. It's a very elementary paper giving all the uh, nice basic results you need to understand anything in that domain. He calls that a very useful type of theorem. It's a quotation. So now, how do you prove that? Well, I can't expect you to find it in one or in ten seconds. <laughs> but I would guess that if you're interested, you would say, okay, let me think about it. So each a n is an intersection of things of the form q n i arrow e n i 
that makes tuning disease. Uh, this is a countable connection of things. Uh, now I need to have these countable sums split at each index in finitely pieces. Should probably reorganize that into kinds of countable unions of rectangles somehow. If you do that, after half an hour you get lost. <laughs> <coughs> so instead, I use a nifty trick. I was incredibly proud of having found it myself. And then I, um, 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 I don't know how I do that, but uh, the next day I realized it, this was a basic trick used in a theorem called the Wormnix Ulam theorem. And I'm um, calling that the Wormnix Ulam trick, and it's completely from outer space. It says to check this, try to find a measure that coincides with this one. What does this mean? I mean, I mean, we are looking for a measure. <coughs> How can this happen? Well, the trick is you need that measure to coincide with pi on the A ends and on the other union, not on the whole sigma algebra. And this is much easier, in particular in that case. Um, is it a pi system? Oh, it's a pi system too, yes. Yeah. Oh, so now my next hint is that you've suddenly realized that these things, the ANs, can be written uh, intersection over I as Q and I or E and I. So there are only countably many Qs and E's. Does this give you a hint? Well, I'm not sure. But anyway, what you can do is build the product measure on these countably many states. Um, that just means that you build a measure on this distinguished countable subfamily of states, which is exactly what I said you should do in the finite case, that is, choose a transition uh, for each of these states according to the probability given by the randomized scheduler at random independently. Now, it turns out that we assume there was at least one measurable selection. And if you take a measurable selection sigma zero and take and fix a transition for each state, so for each state Q and I, you pick a transition T and I, take the vector of these things, then you can patch sigma zero so that, uh, so that you get a new selection. Uh, this selection maps every Q and I to the prescribed choices T and I, and for the other states, you take sigma zero. I'm actually a bit lying, but this works assuming another assumption, which I, is not needed, but anyway. So it turns out that this selection is again measurable, and it turns out that this map from the vectors of transitions to measurable selections is also a measurable map. Now, um, everything training in category theory will know what I will do. It's a very basic category theory. Um, there's um, a functor, um, the, the measure, the probability uh, space uh, functor, which you can apply to this morphism patch. Essentially, that means you can build the image measure. So you've got a measure Tn on this space. You can push it forward using patch to give a measure on cell theta. What it does, essentially, <coughs> this new measure mu, is it chooses transitions at each of the countably many positions <coughs> randomly with the right probability independently. <coughs> And it does some strange thing outside of it, but we don't care. And we're done. Essentially, the exact uh, end of the argument is the middle of the equation is because mu is a measure. Mu equals pi bar on that kind of set. Mu equals pi bar on that kind of set. Done. Alright, so the summary is you can actually pick measurable selections at random so that the obvious uh, probabilities are satisfied. And more than that, essentially you can do so so that any countable subcollection of values obtained at uh, states is independent. But the whole collection can't be because the whole collection has to be measurable. This enforces some dependence. Uh, by the way, corollary of this theorem is that you can actually average out over all um, um, pure schedulers, and this gives you 
the average of any payoff function h given by the randomized scheduler starting from q. Um, and this is only the beginning. So this must not my last slide, by the way. So I cheated a bit because what I've shown you is for schedulers that do choose only one transition and then stop. The real challenge is what can you do for schedulers that actually build trajectories which iterate infinitely. So that also works. Um, by essentially the same techniques plus a few added complications, um, see the paper. Um, you only need one additional assumption, which is shown below, which is that Q and P should be spaces with measurable diagonals, which is a condition that's automatically satisfied for Polish spaces, for example. Uh, not for analytic spaces, I'm sorry, this is why it's not a true marginal setting. Uh, measure, uh, having a measurable diagonal means that the set of pairs XX should be measurable. It's equivalent to saying that there's a countable collection of measurable subsets with separate points. Um, but essentially everything works. Um, final word, this is always a paper. Apparently I've been known for writing extremely complicated papers. <laughs> I really tried hard to make this one readable. And then I consider this as my tribute to Prakash. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, the question is vague enough so that I can answer yes or no and be sure. <laughs> um, but um, let's say that. Um, uh, sorry, I'm jumping onto the wrong part of your question on purpose. Uh, <laughs> so, it has no connection at all with ETHOS integral, for example. Uh, in fact, once I had a discussion with a colleague, Serge Haddad, who tried to explain to me why ETHOS integral was a, an, um, the production of a genius. And I told him, well, I thought that ETHOS integral was just that kind of integral that I did say. And he eventually convinced me that it was an entirely different beat. Um, it, it's indeed something very different. In, in, um, it's something that really has... Um, you, you should define it the way it is. So that is, with a special way of convergent uh, Riemann sums, um, and uh, with a specific way of uh, looking at convergence. Um, and this is an entirely different beat. So, I'm jumping on that because I have no other answer to the rest of your question, <laughs> unless you make it more specific. Well, it's difficult because I don't really know that theory too well, but there's the notion of tight convergence, where you, that was slightly reminiscent of your construction, where you're sampling discountable many states, mm -hmm. and you pull out a, a standard measure, yeah. actually going to coincide with the one you're trying to, to build the, the pie of, the, you know, and that trick. Well, I don't know this, so I can't Because standard presentation of stochastic integration are based on ah, discrete oh, perhaps you refer to things like the existence of Brownian motion, so that is, of... Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't remember the of these measures. Uh, so, indeed, uh, this is slightly similar. The same, oh, so, another point of contact is what you said about the ability to define your selector uh, independently in countably Absolutely, uh, you're perfectly right. Eh? Which is I, I've tried to discuss that in the paper in uh, something like two lines, but it's a bit uh, sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, indeed, when you try to build the Wiener measures, so that's the Wiener measures, um, you need to uh, select continuous maps at random, and the way you do that is with a very complicated process, where indeed you select a dense subset of the real line, uh, um, uh, um, pick random elements of those elements of the dense subset, and then complete by continuity. And you can do that because of some complicated lemma that says that it, you, you actually had a, a uniformly convergent way of uh, converging this way. It turns out that our problem is, in a sense of the same nature, but incredibly more, uh, incredibly simpler. Measurability is not that much of a concern compared to continuity. Okay, I guess we better stop here. Okay, thank you.